This video discusses the largest scale paleoecological trends observed in the fossil record, like shifts in local community composition, changes in the ecological attributes of marine organisms, and global transitions in the types of organisms that dominate marine ecosystems. Today, bivalves and gastropods are the dominant shelly invertebrates in the ocean, and the vast majority of the shells you'd find walking along the beach, but that wouldn't necessarily have been the case in earlier parts of the geological record. We'll start at a relatively fine ecological scale, the level of the community, and then work towards bigger spatial, temporal, and taxonomic scales. So a biological community, at its simplest, is just a group of species that live together in an area. But why do those specific species co-occur together in a community? On one extreme, communities could be predictable associations of species, where those species always live together because they're linked to each other by positive interactions like mutualism or facilitation. At the other end, maybe communities are just haphazard collections of different species that only happen to coexist with each other because they share similar environmental requirements. As with most things, the reality is, is no doubt somewhere between these two end members, but let's see what the fossil record can tell us. So the fossil record suggests that paleo communities are actually quite stable, at least in terms of species presence and absence, and especially for the common species within a community. And this stability lasts for a few million years before being restructured uh, fairly rapidly, maybe in a hundred thousand years or less. So this is, observation has been called coordinated stasis. It's kind of like a community level analog of punctuated equilibrium. This figure is based on a classic area for coordinated stasis, the Devonian of, of New York. It's got a lot going on, but just focus on these vertical um, columns of boxes. Each one represents a species. So within this red rectangle, most of these species occur throughout the entire interval, but many of them are not found earlier, they're not found in the blue box, some are, most aren't, and they're not found later. So this is the idea of coordinated stasis. These species are persistent for quite a long time, but then there's a fairly rapid changeover, and then a different group of species are found. So does this imply that communities are just more, are simply more than random assortments of independent species? Well, it probably does. This is probably not a surprise to people who are familiar with modern communities. But what causes this taxonomic stasis? So notice that most species appear at the base of the coordinated stasis interval and then persist throughout much of it. The turnover between these intervals likely relates to some sort of environmental perturbation. But even besides that, very few species evolve or immigrate during the interval. The red arrow points to one example, but there aren't very many of these sort of examples. So the concept of incumbency is one potential explanation. I mentioned incumbency in the context of extinction and origination, but briefly, it begins with the premise that species fulfill certain ecological roles or niches within a community. The species that are already present or the incumbents have advantages because of their large population size, they're already occupying space in the community and so forth, so they can persist and they can prevent immigration of other species or evolution of other species with similar ecological roles. So, for example, in the Devonian, there are two basins, the Michigan Basin and Appalachian Basin, that are geographically nearby and share many genera in common, but they often have unique and distinct species in each location. When sea level is low, these two basins were separated from each other by a barrier that would allow allopatric speciation, leading to different species in the two regions. But even when sea level rose and connections formed, like the red arrow, that could allow dispersal, Species distinctiveness was still maintained, perhaps by incumbency. So in the case of coordinated stasis, the existing species in the community are the incumbents, and so they may persist and reduce or prevent immigration and evolution until some sort of environmental disruption removes them and allows new species to take over. If we move to larger taxonomics and, and temporal scales, Similar types of ecological stasis have been observed. These have been called ecological evolutionary units, or EEUs. For example, in a late Paleozoic community, they're often dominated by productive brachiopods, like the ones illustrated here. Whereas Ordovician communities instead contained abundant orthid brachiopods, strophomenids, like the ones here, and trilobites. 
So these EEU intervals are longer intervals of community stability, on the order of tens of millions of years long. And the stability manifests itself at higher taxonomic levels, like at the order or the family level. Within them, the genus or species composition tends to change more gradually. Um, these stable EEUs, where you have fairly consistent dominance by certain families or orders, um, persist again for these sort of tens of millions of year intervals, uh, but are separated by shorter reorganization intervals that have fairly rapid clade turnover, where maybe pre-existing clades or newly evolved clades can expand to environments or habitats that are now vacated after the previous incumbents were removed. So like coordinated stasis, EEU transitions probably required some sort of environmental perturbation, but likely a larger perturbation than was responsible for changing the genera or species in coordinated stasis. These often line up with mass extinction events, like a smaller one in the Cambrian, but especially the Big Five traditional Phanerozoic mass extinctions. The biggest scale of faunal organization includes these things called evolutionary faunas. An evolutionary fauna is simply a grouping of clades, often unrelated clades that had ver widely varying ecological traits, like bivalves and marine mammals. Uh, but these clades all shared broadly similar diversity trajectories. For example, the Cambrian fauna groups clades that all tended to have the peak of their diversity in the Cambrian. So trilobites are really the most characteristic member of that group, but you can see it includes a few other minor groups. The Paleozoic fauna instead is dominated by brachiopods, crinoids, and stenolomate bryozoans, whereas the modern fauna includes a wide variety of completely different groups, uh, but most distinctively bivalves and gastropods. The shifts between these faunas ended up coinciding with some of the biggest events of the Phanerozoic, like the Ordovician radiation and the end Permian mass extinction. So all these examples of ecological change are nested as a hierarchy, with large shifts such as the transition between evolutionary faunas occurring infrequently and affecting things up to very high taxonomic levels, and the smaller shifts occurring much more frequently. So the EEUs were on the scale of tens of millions of years and featured changes at maybe the order or family taxonomic level, whereas coordinated stasis affected only genus and species level typically and occurred at million year type timescales. So to understand why there are these scales of faunal change, remember that these ecological shifts are thought to be facilitated by environmental disruptions that have removed the incumbent taxa. So the hierarchy of faunal change likely results from a continuum of environmental disruptions or disturbances. The most severe disturbances, like giant meteorite impacts or enormous flood basalt eruptions that are required to eliminate incumbents at high taxonomic levels occur very rarely, whereas smaller disturbances that may be able to affect just a couple species are going to be more frequent. So these small disturbances might have involved things like sea level change over tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. Very small disturbances like a giant hurricane that might occur every decade or so in the tropics, uh, are going to be minor enough that they maybe don't even affect any species. So how have these faunal changes affected ecology in the marine realm? Well, we'll use this concept of guilds to categorize the ecology of an organism. The guild is a, is a broader concept than the idea or the related idea of a biological niche, which I mentioned previously. Uh, a guild can contain many species without them competing with each other and without them necessarily driving one another to extinction, as is traditionally thought in the strict definition of a, of a niche, which can only be occupied by one species. So guilds are often characterized by their life habit, feeding strategy, and, and so forth. So ammonites could be a pelagic motile carnivore, crino to be an erect epifaunal sessile suspension feeder. We can create a matrix to categorize or to describe the occupation of ecospace using substrate relationships like tiering from shallow infaunal, deep infaunal, erect epifaunal, feeding like deposit feeding or predatory, and motility like fast motile or attached non-motile. This results in 216 possible combinations, but not all of those are biologically feasible. Maybe about 120 of them are. For example, you, you can't really have a non-motile 
pelagic deposit feeder, for example. So let's use this framework to compare shelly fossil assemblages from the mid-Paleozoic and the late Cenozoic. Each box within these exploded cube reflects a single guild. And they have colors if there are species within those guilds, and the colors indicate the relative abundance of that particular guild. So there are some striking differences between the mid-Paleozoic and the Cenozoic. Uh, first, let's compare shallow and deep in faunal over time. Those are the two bottom rows of this exploded cube. So note how much more abundant in fauna is during the Cenozoic. Um, in terms of you know the the Paleozoic, there's basically nothing in the deep in fauna, and the shallow in fauna are all pretty rare. Less than five percent are in the shallow in fauna. But in the Cenozoic. Shallow, epi, uh, shallow in faunal suspension feeders are shaded orange. They're some of the more common individuals in the Cenozoic. In terms of surficial epifauna, the Paleozoic is really dominated by suspension feeders, those two red boxes, which are um, attached and unattached non-motile suspension feeders. But the Cenozoic instead contains grazers and predators, those sort of yellow and, and yellow or green boxes as the dominant gills. So overall, the shift from epifaunal suspension feeders to shallow infaunal suspension feeders and motile epifaunal grazers and predators was really associated with this transition from the Paleozoic to the modern evolutionary fauna and has been a huge fundamental change in the ecology of marine communities over time.